On the agenda tonight, we have an invitation for public comment. We have two comments that were submitted in writing previously, uh, and then it looks like we have some in-person comment. I will ask that for in-person comment, our bylaws state that each comment be limited to three minutes or less. I'm not gonna time you, but just keep in mind that that's the general guideline. You're also welcome if the person who speaks before you is saying the same thing to add your name to that comment. There's no need to repeat if it's exactly the same thing, but we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And uh, again, thank you for coming and we're happy to see you. Um, on the agenda tonight, the purpose of this meeting is to discuss the budget for next year. So um, at, we are not discussing return to school. It's, that's not on the agenda tonight. So um, I hope you understand that we won't be engaging in a dialogue uh, with public comment. That's just how it's always worked. That's what our bylaws state. Um, and then there's some materials that um, I will distribute to board members in the administration after the meeting that one of the member, members of the public brought with. So you can look okay. forward to that. Okay, so with that, let's um, start rolling with the uh, public comment that was submitted. In Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, I'm so sorry. Pledge. We need to do the public. I'm ready to jump right in since we're <laughs> running late. My apologies. Let's start with the pledge. <clears throat> And now we will do the roll call. Jim Batson. Here. Sarah Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Tara Drumkey. Lisa Hessel. Here. Kunal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Okay, great. Hey, Lisa, just uh, just a couple other things for the record, because I think this question was raised by someone in the audience tonight. So uh, Lisa's talked about the purpose of the meditation and discussion about the FY22 uh, budget. Uh, for the coming school year. Um, but uh, uh, I think the question was raised that uh, the meeting wasn't posted as other meetings have been. The meeting was posted just as we're required to do and that we've done for every meeting for the last 15 years here. And that's 48 hours prior to the meeting. So this was posted Friday. All the meetings over the course of this past school year were also posted 48 hours before uh, the meeting. So just to clear that up. And then uh, I think there was a comment or a question about uh, capacity limit and trying to use that limit to damp down <laughs> uh, public comment. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, in the lead in the opening school last year, the board received 400 to 500 messages before two months of meetings. Every one of those messages was read by every board member and every administrator in the district. Um, every discussion that was had about opening school last year was had in a public forum. Uh, there were no behind the scenes meetings. Uh, first of all, that can't happen under Illinois law, but all of those conversations happened in public. And that's why those meetings were four, four and a half, five hours long, because that all took place, uh, in the public. And then there was a question I think raised again about capacity here, uh, capacity under the governor's proclamation. Uh, initially, we have to measure the space here, take that into consideration. And actually that's been increased from 10 to 15. And if we need to look at that again, uh, or look at a different location to have the meeting in order to accommodate more people, that's something that the board can have. A, a, but nobody who wants to address the board either in person or in uh, writing is gonna be denied the opportunity to do that under any circumstances. Uh, no matter what they are. So I just wanted to clear that up for everyone because I, I heard some of those questions had been raised. Okay. Thank you, Francis. I appreciate that. And yes, um, we definitely, um, not only by law are we required to listen to public comment, but we we're very happy when we have public participation in our meeting. So with that, um, we're going to start with the two uh, emails Wait. that were sent prior to the meeting, and then we'll get <coughs> to the uh, in-person. Um. I'm not sure your mic is Brian, on. Brian, is your mic on? Holding it, yes. Or maybe Francis. If I hold mine, it goes off. Should I light? It depends on how it is. 
Yeah, we're waiting. You hear me now? <laughs> you have a green light? It's like a commercial. Can you hear me now? You have a green light? Yes, when I hold it. Huh. Okay, just talk loud. Coach's voice, Brian. All right, uh, dear 120 Board of Education, in advance of today's uh, Board of Education meeting, I am writing in support of a full reopening without mandatory masks of Vernon Hills in fall 2021. By the time the 2021 year begins, all Vernon Hills students will have been eligible for the vaccine for 90 plus days, plenty of time for families choosing to vaccinate their children to do so. By that time, all major retailers, places of worship, and restaurants will have largely re relaxed their guidelines for mandatory mask wearing for 100 plus days. If our vaccinated children can go to dinner, the grocery store, the hardware store, et cetera, without masks, they most certainly can attend school without one. In my view, each school now needs to fall into one of the following categories. One, vaccinated slash comfortable to return to school without a mask. Two, unvaccinated and willing to return to school with or without a mask. Or three, pursue alternate education for their child unless there is a very specific medical reason signed off by their physician. Approximately 60% of my incoming junior's high school career has been impacted by COVID-19. She has two years left to prepare for college and the world beyond. I cannot sit idly by and not advocate for the full return of the high school experience for her and all of their children in our district. Let the, children, let the teachers teach, coaches coach, and the staff and administration do their jobs free of this no longer necessary barrier to learning. We have an amazing staff at Vernon Hills High School. Let them do their jobs and give parents what we are paying for, a full high school experience our children deserve. Sincerely, Garrett Self of Vernon Hills. Second public comment is from Janine and Scott Doherty. The agenda stated goals with re regards to racial equity. Does this mean implementing critical race theory into the mainstream curriculum? I am requesting further clarification, including specific details as to how you plan on addressing racial equity. We strongly object to our four children being taught anything having to do with critical race theory or anything similar to this ideology because of the fact that it promotes racism and hate. Janine and Scott Doherty. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Okay, we invite uh, the first person who wants to address the board to step up to the mic and state your name. Hello, is Hi. it on? Yes, it you're good, you're good. Okay, so my name is Lynn Ulrich, and I've been an anesthetist since for 35 years approximately. So my business is airways, okay? I put people to sleep for surgery in and out of the operating room. I've been doing it for a long time. So I'm an expert at the airway, okay? So a lot of people just say, well, wear the mask, right? Just wear it. It helps you. It helps others, right? No one goes into what are the ill effects of wearing a mask, and there are many. Okay, so I'm going to go over a few. I left a handout along with a study uh, back at the table back there. So I think everyone can tell when they wear a mask, they have resistance to breathing, right? So every time you take a breath, every single breath, you're breathing against resistance. That puts stress on your body and it makes something as comfortable as breathing not comfortable. So it, it taxes your body every single solitary breath, okay, including our children. It decreases your oxygen. People say, oh, no, it doesn't. Well, it does, okay, for multiple reasons. And I'm looking to see if I see anyone with a big pocketed mask. I see the blue the guy with blue. The bigger the mask, the more your carbon dioxide is going to pull, pocket, whatever you want to call it, in that mask. So every single solitary breath you take, there's a small amount, whatever it is, 5 cc's, 10 cc's, that dilutes your oxygen, okay? When you exhale, your carbon dioxide is 4%. That's enormous. The air around us is 0.038% carbon dioxide. So your, your oxygen is diluted. Your carbon dioxide that you're inhaling is extremely high, okay? A certain amount of it. I said it already. So stress. This puts stress on your body, okay? Some people, uh, it stresses more than others. And you can tell by looking at them, they're huffing, 
puffing, is it, they're sweating, right? Children are skinny, usually, and healthy, right? So they're able to compensate. You can't look at them and see it, but there is a change. Their oxygen, let's just say it goes from 100 millimeters mercury to 90, okay? It's just a little bit, but there's certain things in our body that love low oxygen. One is the second killer in our NUS, okay? Cancer. Cancer loves low oxygen environments, okay? And you can't see the kids are stressful, right? Uh, because they're just young and healthy. So you got to keep that in mind. Even though you look at them, you think they're normal, they're okay, but they are on distress. Stress hurts your immune system. We, we all want our immune systems to work great, right? That's, that's what we talk about all the time. Your immune system will take care of things. Well, if you're under stress every day, your immune system is lower. If you look at this, my husband and I took some Petri dishes at home, excuse me, and I wore a mask for one hour while cooking, one hour, and we plated the, the mask on the inside of the mask, and this is what grew. Tons of bacteria, mold, it's disgusting, lots of it, right? So, you know, everybody takes their mask off, and they, last time I spoke, my glasses had someone's mask on top of it. It's totally disgusting what's growing in these masks. And this is one hour of someone like me. We all know how dirty kids are, right? And they're sneezing and wiping their nose. There was six moms in Florida who took it upon themselves to send this, their kids' masks to uh, uh, somewhere to be tested. There was extremely toxic bacteria, meningi meningococcal bacteria that grew in these kids' masks. And they're sucking it, and no virus was in their mask. They're sucking this, you are too, right into your lungs, okay? Normally, you don't suck this stuff right into your lungs. So bacterial pneumonia could be on the increase. If you look at the Spanish flu in the 1900s, bacterial pneumonia was high, okay? So just think about that. So that is a little bit past the three-minute limit. Are you almost finished? Okay, yes, I am. Psychological stress, okay? We all know, okay, you can't see people's faces. You don't know if they're happy, sad. I mean, we communicate by facial expressions, especially children, right? So it's psychologically stressing. These kids are going to walk around like little robots. It's terrible for them. Okay, so that being said, uh, the United States is a country of laws, right? We have laws for everything. We are not a country of guidelines or recommendations. So Right now, I can think of a few laws that the school board and everyone who is trying to force these masks and different things on us are breaking. Discrimination, right? Medical discrimination. I have a medical reason. I don't wear a mask. We all should because of everything I just said, right? So um, also, I, I really think it's child abuse. To have these masks, I think it's child abuse, right? And um, so parents... I'm speaking for, we have a group of us, about 150 or more. We meet every week, and there's many of us. I just came here to represent them. You guys are representing us. So I don't, we don't want to hear that your hands are tied. We don't want to hear there's nothing you can do. We do not want our children in this abusive mask when they go back to school. Okay? So we're not going to stand for it. Please do whatever you can because it, it's really bad for them. It's abuse, and I don't say that lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address the board? Hi. Hello. You can pull it down a little bit. There you go. I know I'm so short. It's always the trouble. <laughs> Um, if you so, could state your name, please. Yes, I was. Yes, I will. I'm Dina Hanbury. Um, I'm going to read three of my pages. I, I didn't realize it was three minutes. And then my husband's going to read the second half. So this way we stay legally within the three minutes. There you go. Hello, my name is Dina Hanbury. And I have five kids in the Libertyville district. And three will be at LHS in the fall. And I'm here to raise my voice for them. We moved here. When we moved here, everyone told us how wonderful the schools were. And we were pleased to learn that we were in a great neighborhood school and they performed very well. So we started our journey at Copeland Manor, Highland Middle School, and now LHS. As the years have gone by, I've seen a steady decrease in the overall satisfaction in the schools. 
We all want what is best for our students and we can agree about that, but I believe that our students are not getting the best of Libertyville. I have four issues that I would like to bring to your attention. I believe the mask mandate should not be mandatory. New segregation should not be tolerated with the vaxxed and the unvaxxed. The comprehensive sex education is, plan is wrong and damaging and male bashing is not what our young men should hear. The first area of concern is the mask mandate for the upcoming school year. We all know that what works for one person does not automatically work for everyone. It is not one size fits all. An example is different learning styles. Not everyone can tolerate wearing a mask and forcing students to wear one shouldn't be the norm. This age group has a survival rate of 99.997% if they get the virus and masking them is overkill for something that they are not in the category, risk category for. A few of my children do not tolerate wearing masks and they complain of frequent headaches that are so bad that they have to take Advil and lay down when they get home. In addition, my children feel like they are not allowed to take drinks while they are in school. They are not allowed to take down their mask, so they are dehydrated. On May 19th of this year, my eighth grader passed out while wearing his mask in band rehearsal. Yes, they are forced to wear a mask in band while he was playing his bass clarinet. He was standing and passed out from a standing position and hit his head. This is not acceptable. We need to do better for this next school year. Please remove the mask requirement. School today has gone out of its way to make everyone feel accepted and valued with so many ways to be connected within the walls of the community at LHS and Vernon Hills. Extracurricular activities from guitar, caring for Cambodia, the physics club, and the LGBTQ are all places to connect. And I ask that we would not throw all of this out by creating a new segregation plan for the vaxxed and the unvaxxed. That is not accepting or welcoming. Each and everyone has their own freedom to make that decision for what is best for their own body. Please do not shame or reward anyone for their personal decision if they got the shot or not. Please start the new year free of masks and do not segregate the school body. Thirdly, I'm extremely concerned about the comprehensive sex ed plan that I have learned about that is coming this way. I beg you not to use any of this curriculum. Let me tell you my own personal story, please. When I was a little girl and a young teen, I had a family member tell me graphic things about the female body and sexual activity and even showed me things. I was scarred by that, deeply scarred. You might ask, how could that be if she were a female sharing that kind of information with me? I was traumatized by what my older sister did. She never touched me, but she shared so much information with me and it was unacceptable and it was wrong. There was no need for me to learn about sex and the details when I was a child or a teenager. I ask you to reject this teaching to our kids. One of my girls who is in seventh grade is so sensitive and it is my job to protect her. She should not learn, excuse me for the graphic, she should not learn what anal sex is. I'm sorry. How, how can we as adults think it's okay to explain, I won't say it, the male anatomy part that starts with the P to be put inside the part that I just mentioned because there are little children here. I can't say that in front of them. And I don't think we should as adults. We can't say that. Didn't that make you feel awkward and uncomfortable that I just said that out loud and in public? I think it should. I think that's an indicator that it's wrong for us to say these things to students. I think it's abusive for us to force children to listen to this kind of information. Ma'am, 
I don't want to rush you, but you're at your three minute over your three minute limit. Are you almost done? I can stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anson Hanbury. I want to thank you for giving a hearing and listening to what people have to say from the community. Um, so you've heard my wife's comments. You've heard about her, um, her personal story in connection to some of the curriculum that we've heard is coming uh, our way. And I just want to share um, a little bit more, finishing out the comments that she has introduced. We are looking into a different school choice for our younger kids. Uh, because of these various concerns, um, our older kids, we plan to continue at LHS. Uh, so we want to obviously make our concerns and reservations known about them. Um, the final thing is we've taught our kids to be responsible, caring, and contributing people in our society. Uh, our oldest son, he's going to be a senior at LHS. Good kid. He's had a god, good job for two years. He's on the wrestling team. He's had several AP classes. Um, does a good job in school and cares as a conscientious student. Uh, one of the concerns that he's had this year is just a continual voicing of political and social opinions from his teacher. Um, when we went to school, it wasn't part of the agenda that we would know our teacher's political opinions uh, and their, their feelings on social issues and the like. Um, but in our experience, there's been a continual running commentary on how various teachers feel, and they make it very clear uh, how they think and what they expect the students to think. Uh, in our opinion, this should not be. Uh, we think they should teach the kids how to think, uh, not what to think with regard to these issues. Um, our son's AP European history or AP US history teacher this past year uh, sort of consistently was voicing her opinions, um, particularly on gender issues. Uh, and we, we heard from our son what we would consider male bashing, uh, continually put down um, because of her opinions about male and female. And we found this to be totally unacceptable. Um, we've gone out of our way to try to teach our son to be a strong, courageous young man who stands up for what is right. Um, we believe we need more strong men. Um, and my wife in particular, I would tell you if she were reading her comments right now, uh, how offended she is personally uh, when our son comes home and feels like he's been degraded simply because of his gender. Um, we don't wanna make him feel bad for trying to be a strong and responsible young man. So again, thank you for considering what we have to say and for hearing the stories of our experience and our school system that we really do uh, care a lot about. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Kinnahan Schaefer. I did send an email, uh, but I realized I sent it after three, so it wouldn't be read tonight. So I thought I better come. Um, I, I was spurred on to come. I started reading the agenda um, and I noticed how many times historically marginalized students, equity, culturally responsive teaching, which is critical race theory, and we all know it. We all know it. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, I started noticing just like everything was, was sort of geared towards this small population. And I wasn't seeing just the word students. I was seeing these particular students. And then on the third page, under student achievement, this is what, this is what got me and what spurred me on. District 128 will ensure that every child will make significant academic, academic gains each year, increasing their knowledge, skills, and opportunities so they graduate equipped to pursue a successful future, comma, with special attention paid to historic inequities. That's when I went, what the hell is going on? I would like to know, I know that this is a budget meeting, so I'm gonna keep it to the budget because I think we all know where I stand on critical race theory poisoning my innocent children's brains. Innocent white children who have nothing to do with anything. So some of the ugly history in this nation and critical race theory is not about teaching factual history. 
It is an agenda. It's a politically motivated agenda. We all know it. So we're here about budget. So I'll, I'll go to budget. I notice we're hiring equity co coordinator positions, plural. Nothing about what that means. What is an equity coordinator? What are instructional coaches that are being hired by the district? What are their specific tasks? What is this role responsibilities? Who are these people? What is their salary? And how many are being hired at taxpayers' expenses? What kinds of funds are being spent to send every one of our teachers to culturally responsive teacher training? And what kind of expert speakers will be brought in at what expense to the taxpayers? Who are these expert speakers? I want names so that I can research these speakers, see what they're about, see what they're teaching, and see what they're charging. I'm pissed. This is not what school is for. This is not what teachers are. They're not to be political proponents. It's, hap it's already happened. But this agenda here, and I didn't even get very far. When I read, comma, with special attention paid to historic inequities, all this rhetoric without specifics. Who are these equity coordinators? Who's running these, uh, uh, these groups that you said are getting together? Let's see. So we're the race we're, equity we're, diver excuse diversity. Excuse me. We're, we're well beyond the three minute limit. So if you could wrap up your comments, I'm going to wrap it up right now. I also just want to quickly mention that teachers are pissed. Teachers are talking amongst themselves. They're going to leak out the crap that they're going to be forced to do and say they're leaking. They've already said it. We're going to leak it. They're angry. They don't agree with it. I see the staff survey. I don't see anything that the teachers pointed out in their staff survey as being important. None of it. None of that crap is in there. Thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Collins. Uh, earlier, you said I could put my name to what everyone said. So I'd like to put my name. I'm sorry, I don't know the last speaker, but I agree. And I'd like to add my name to that in the notes, I guess. So thank you for that opportunity to do that. That was great. So I have to repeat myself. I am not as prepared as my um, friends over there, my new friends. So I, I just off the cuff, I just want to say a couple of things. I too am a mother of five. My husband and I have lived in Vernon Hills 25 years. We love it here. Four of my oldest children have graduated from Vernon Hills High School. They love this school. They absolutely loved it. Um, my last child, who's going to be a senior, I gave him the opportunity to um, maybe switch schools, but he wanted to come here. So we let him because I could see the stuff brewing that we're talking about. My last child is going to be a freshman and I put him in Carmel. So talking about the budget, my husband and I will be sacrificing this money. I pay, a, we all, we all pay a lot of taxes to live here because of these great schools. And we're choosing not to go to this great school because of what this has all just been said. And it breaks my heart that my last child will not be graduating from Vernon Hills High School because of the political agenda that is being pretty much rammed down our throats. And I don't understand all this confusion of what happened here. This is, I want reading, writing, arithmetic, the old fashioned stuff. I don't want political stuff. My junior last year came home during a, a week of promoting 
I don't know what you were promoting. I didn't get the exact title, but he said, mom, they told me over the loudspeaker at Vernon Hills high school. I can't ask my buddy how his girlfriend is because that will offend him or other people who heard me ask my buddy how his girlfriend is because he may have a boyfriend or he may have a transgender friend or he may have. So I love all people. I really, really do. But to teach my son that he can't ask his buddy how his girlfriend is because that's going to offend people. Confusion. I don't understand. Why are you teaching my 16 year old? He can't ask his buddy how his girlfriend is or his girlfriend, how their boyfriend is trying to get rid of all these genders is very confusing and scary. It's been taught forever. I don't understand this agenda being push, push, push. I don't like it. I don't want it. Um, so the budget, my budget's going to be a lot less this year in my personal home. And I, so talking about money, money's a big thing for all of us. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, just ditto. I, I don't want my kids with masks. If every, if, if people like my body, my choice, that's a big thing in this world right now. If people want to get um, the shot and wear masks, let them protect themselves. But if people don't want to let them protect themselves the way they think is best, why do we have to do everything? And if someone is wearing a mask and someone is getting the shots to prevent COVID that they think it will prevent COVID, we don't exactly know yet because it's also new, very, very new to us. Not The shot just came out in January. Um, we don't know all the repercussions yet. So I just want to encourage to please have you think, can we not just go everything so fast? Let's wait and see. Um, I guess that's all I want to say. I'm glad you're here. And, and you said you will always listen to us and you will always hear our writings and our voices. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. And I so much appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Going once, going twice. Okay, we're gonna move on with our agenda then. Thank you everybody for coming. You're very welcome to stay. Um, next on the agenda is the consolidated district plan for fiscal year 22. This was uh, discussed in uh, committee meeting uh, earlier in the month and uh, we need to bring this back uh, by um, state protocol. Uh, to have the board uh, vote on this. So Rita, do you want to do a quick overview? Sure. The consolidated district plan is a planning tool for uh, our grant applications that uh, the Illinois State Board of Education requires districts to complete annually uh, prior to writing their grant application. As Prentice said, we reviewed this at committee and discussed um, the required components of the consolidated plan, which calls for information regarding Title I, Title II, Title IV, and IDEA grants. Um, so what you have is the required submission to the Illinois State Board of Education and the summary of the required goals related to each of those grants. Happy to answer any questions regarding the consolidated district plan. So administration would recommend that uh, we approve the consolidated plan as uh, the board has seen submitted and discuss that committee meeting and review tonight at the board meeting. Right. And as a point of order, we can discuss it further after we have a motion and a second. So if we have a motion to accept the board's rec the administration's recommendation to uh, approve the consolidated plan as submitted. I move to approve the consolidated plan. Thank you. Second. Second. Great. Any discussion? I have a couple things to say. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what a lot of work. So what was the document? 78 pages long. The summary was 20 something pages long. Thank you for putting the summary together because the document, it's just been hard to read in the past. Um, but that's, uh, you know, paying attention to where the, the federal money is going is 
uh, not only required by law, but it tells us where our money is being spent, what the programs are that are using that money. Um, the federal dollars can only go to certain things and keeping track of what those certain things are and applying them appropriately is a difficult task. And I would like to thank Rita for taking care of it. Thank you. Thank you. We certainly had a lot of help from uh, Kelly uh, Hartweg, uh, definitely specializes in the IDEA grant and compiled much of the information related to IDEA. Uh, and uh, many of the goals set forth in the title grant planning are collaboratively designed with the building principles and leadership as well. So um, while I am responsible for summarizing and submitting, it represents a lot of work from many people in the district. Julie noted. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, seeing none. Can we get a vote, please? B Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the FY22 initial budget presentation and discussion. Um, I'm okay. assuming we are turning it over to our Associate Superintendent of Finance. Yeah, Mr. I'm going to do one, one quick overview uh, on that just as a review. So as the board and maybe community members who follow the budgeting process every year will remember is usually about this time in June, we have a standalone meeting uh, for the initial budget uh, presentation and discussion. This is not the final budget. Uh, it allows uh, Dan an opportunity to go through the budgeting process, which is a good review for all of us, um, including the administrators uh, as well, who have been involved in that process. Um, and uh, as he goes through that overview uh, and he begins to uh, put numbers within the budget, uh, then the budget begins to take shape. So on the 26th, um, we will have um, our budget hearing uh, uh, again, as a part of the meeting cycle. But remember that budget hearing is not a final decision on the budget. So again, another opportunity for Dan to do a review um, and uh, take a look at where our budget is. Uh, that gives the uh, public uh, the legal opportunity to come in and make comments on the budget. Uh, and then there'll be you know additional uh, conversation on the budget before we adopt that after that. So that's just the process. Uh, how did we get here so we don't do a one or two step process uh, because we found it very helpful, uh, I think, over the years uh, to take this in pieces and chunks. So uh, we have the opportunity to understand where we're at, make adjustments. I have additional conversation before the budget is uh, presented. And of course, Dan does a great job uh, putting the budget together with everyone that he works with, but um, also in explaining the budget uh, you know, it's a very understandable uh, level for lay people uh, who don't know much about school budgets. So with that said, we are going to turn a it over. a specific date for the hearing? 26th. Of so that is going to be at our regular board meeting in July. In That's July. part of the regular board meeting. Okay, great. Thank and you. I'll, I'll get the timeline at the end. Oh, there it is. So. I was just on the wrong month. Thank you. Yeah. June, you were thinking, right? Yeah. A little too soon. All right. Okay, Dan. Good. Uh, so we have it on the share. All right, good. Uh, so welcome everyone to our first look at the fiscal year 22 uh, tentative budget. Um, <clears throat> so for several, we have you know several new board members. Um, this is your first time through this process, and for other board members, this may be only your second or third. Um, for some of you, this is like your 20th. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for hanging with us. Um, uh, yeah. I'm going to walk through a few things. The first is, especially what I want to do with new folks is uh, talk about our process and kind of explain to you what, what process are, what, what is our process and where are we at in that process? Because really we're in a process, we're in the middle of a process that is based on decisions that none of you have made. These were decisions previously made that are now coming to fruition. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through what that process is so you can understand uh, then I'll review our current year budget, fiscal year 21, just to give remind you of kind of what that is. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk through enrollment projections because everything we do is based on our students. Uh, and so how many students we're going to have is important. Um, next, I'm going to talk about COVID-19 impacts on our budget, um, how that's impacted our spending, how do we analyze a budget, all of those things. 
And then the big chunk is going to be on the actual numbers and the tentative budget itself. Uh, so that'll be the bulk of our time going through a lot of information. Um, I did, there is a attachment that has a lot of detailed information, um, but that may be that ev even that information is summarized. So there is even more detailed information that is probably overload on, on details. So um, I've tried to summarize that for you. And then what I'm sharing on here is kind of snippets for the things I really want you to focus on that I think are going to be the most helpful to understand because this is this is a budget uh, year unlike any other. Um, in my entire career, I've never budgeted kind of post a pandemic. So never budgeted during a pandemic either, but that was easier because most things were down. Uh, time, and then finally, we'll talk about a timeline. Just like, so where are we at right now and what is our road? to a budget adoption. Uh, so let's talk about our process. I really believe that our process is student driven. Um, it's driven by the needs and desires of our students. And so really there's two, there's two kind of processes that happen at the same time. The first one is student selection. So course selections and then staffing, staffing for those course selections that students choose. And then, and then similarly, there's other financial planning and budgeting that happens uh, related to that process. So uh, here's the first slide that I just want to spend some time and kind of show you on a visual what this process is. So let's talk. So you can see this is every 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 column is a month. So it starts, for example, March 2020-ish uh, and going through, say, August of 2021. Uh, so really, I I think a lot of a lot of our um, a lot of our student selections kind of starts with this development of new courses. So in the spring, talking to Dr. Fisher, there's discussion about what new courses could be offered in future years. So that happens in the spring, for example. So the, the one we're budgeting right now, those discussions were spring. Um, and then in the fall, the board approves uh, new courses. Uh, so that's like the next step. So the next step after that is uh, the buildings are preparing, so they spend most of the fall and early winter preparing for student course selection. So getting everything ready, getting the curriculum guides ready, uh, getting the class selections ready so that, um, you know, on or about at near winter break or right after the students can begin their course selections. And so the students start selecting those um, that goes through January, February. And then February and March, uh, there's building and district sectioning and staffing. So they go through, look at how many students signed up for each class, um, and then how many sections do you need to run of each of those sections? And it's a very detailed process that the building runs, and then it's brought at the district level. And we spend uh, you know, up to three days looking at that. Uh, from that then um, is brought in March, the staffing plan for board approvals. So the board approves the staffing plan, and that really covers our teachers and administrators. Um, the staffing plan. Uh, after that is our ESP, our support staff. That doesn't, that wouldn't normally happen until like about May because there's a few things we still don't know during staffing. One of that in particular is special needs aides. Um, so our special services department, uh, the aides they need are, de are dependent on IEP meetings that don't wrap up until around that time. So we can't put the cart before the horse because we don't know what those student needs are. Um, so we have to kind of wait for that. That's part of, that's part of our process. Before you move on to the next slide, mm. I know you have a reason for everything you do. I can't figure out what the difference between the blue and the orange is. Is that building driven versus admin? What what's uh, the blue and orange are just no, just the different sections like student sections and staffing. That's the process I'm talking about, and then I'm going to talk about the financial planning and budgeting. No 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 reason for the different colors. Okay, just those are our school colors. So. Uh, oh, I like the selection of the colors. I would have naturally used. chosen yellow or green, but I went with school colors. Um, so then during that process, so once the board approves the staffing plan, then from then on, you know, uh, Bryant and all the departments are posting these positions, interviewing people, hiring people, and get in, getting everything ready to go for the start of school. So that is, I would say, an overview of our student selection and staffing needs. So then on the other side of on the other side of this is financial planning. A lot of that happens concurrently with this process. So for example, while the students are, um, or while, while the buildings are getting ready and the students are starting to make their course selections, I am working on updating our enrollment projections. So October has come and gone and November to do the data. So it's starting December and January, I can update our enrollment projections based on 
actual enrollments is essentially we we do it on October 1st just to kind of let the year settle in a little bit you don't do it like the first week of school because there's a lot of variance that can happen there so I update that in the winter and then after that I, I update our financial projections so January to February we've gotten our audit back and our financial financial reports and everything done from the previous fiscal year and then I use that information to kind of project out what I anticipate for the next five years, revenues, expenditures, trends, all that kind of stuff. And so that gives me kind of an idea of what, where the future is trending. Are we in a position that we can afford um, increased need if we have that, or, or we do we have a, a less than positive outlook? So we've been very fortunate so, so far to have a positive outlook. Um, and then what yeah. happens is during the budgeting, or after the financial projections, um, we go to budgeting for staffing and benefits. And so this is, you know, we start in February because we kind of, we already know the teachers that are, were here last year and they're gonna be here next year. Uh, what we don't know yet is any, any new positions. So we take time and we take a lot of time to make sure we have all the right positions accounted for, that we, we move everybody down in the salary schedules that needs to be moved down. We account for the people that move into retirement track all this kind of stuff that takes kind of a really long time to generate um, that information. So that happens over a period of several months. Uh, and that is the biggest dollar amount of our budget is the people that are the people that work here. Uh, then at the same time, there's also the department budget. So those, those are released uh, right after winter break and the departments have three months while, you know, the student course selection is happening and staffing is happening at the end of March. Uh, they, after spring break, typically they'll submit all of their uh, budget, their department budget requests to me. And we'll take a look and then I'll take the next month or so, two months to review those. Uh, sometimes it takes me a little longer because we have a lot of them. Um, and so I review those. I, so, th so they will budget based on essentially the needs from the classes. So at the department level, especially at the buildings, it's budgeted based on the needs of that department, the students, the classes that they're running, especially if there's a new class, for example. Um, we got to make sure that they account for the new supplies they might need. So they might add a science class or a new section of something that needs more supplies or something like that. And so, so we go through that process. Um, I, I review them. That's a lot of me just trying to clarify them saying what they would like or would need. And I'll clarify like, are, are you sure this is what you need or, or don't you also need this? And so we have a lot of that conversation back and forth. Um, and then usually in those, then after, after that review, then we try to finalize them, just try to get a, a final number on these to see what they look like. Um, and then, then we have expenditures kind of set at that point. We've, we've figured out salaries and benefits. We've figured out department budgets uh, to, a, to a certain extent. And then revenues. Revenues we're kind of looking at for a few months. There's some information we're trying to wait on. Uh, we really don't start that until after we get information about CPI that really comes at the end of January. Uh, so we really don't begin that much earlier. Plus we wanna see kind of how the fiscal year shakes out in terms of actual revenues we're anticipating. Uh, and then put everything together, uh, really June, um, which is the month we're in right now for the tentative budget. Historically, sometimes we've done it in July and even last year we had August because the pandemic just kind of messed everything up. And then the final budget has historically been adopted um, in August or September, um, but you know, you can have a range of when that's adopted. So overall, that's our process, how it works. So where you can see we are at in this process is the second to last. So I would say a lot of the work that goes into building the information behind all these numbers has been done over the last, you know, primarily six months. Um, so any questions on the process? Okay, next time I won't go through it as this long, but I wanted to kind of help you understand from essentially A to Z uh, what we do. That's uh, helpful, thank you. Yeah, so now let's look at fiscal year 21, which is the current fiscal year we're in. That was kind of the last year we've been under. So let me review here for you. So here is, um, this was also in your packet. Um, hey, uh, is there a way to minimize that screen so you can see the whole thing? Please. Whoop, wrong one. <laughs> Hello, mom. <laughs> He's famous. Oh, maybe it is. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. My bad. Um, I'm going to keep going. Do you, well, no, you guys don't have it. You can't see anything, can you? 
Well, we have the one that you sent earlier, but it okay. might be hard to follow along. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. So we have uh, the fiscal year 21 budget. So where it's broken out, the first rows are our revenues. And then the bottom section is expenditures. And so each column is our funds. So if you remember our discussion on the funds, when I had to talk about how we can move money legally between funds. So here's all of our funds, you know, educational operations and maintenance fund, debt service fund, transportation fund, and so forth. Um, you can see all of them listed there with all of our budgeted revenues. So budgeted was our expected or planned revenues and expenditures um, all the way across. And then we have operating funds and then all funds. So essentially what I'm going to, what I'm, what I want you to focus on is operating funds. So we do, we do focus on all of the funds, but we, we, what we, the reason we focus on operating is because operating pulls out one-time expenditures that honestly can really throw you off if you're trying to understand like what is what is changing operationally for the district? So for example, this, this, this building and the additions that we're working on, you know, that we're, I mean, for a lot of people, they look done, but we're, they're still kind of doing punch list stuff. We're not done paying for it yet. Um, you know, 20, call it $25 million project for this. Uh, if we added that in, it would look like our expenditures would massively go up, which they do in total, but running day to day, it doesn't. So we, we, it's an outlier. So we set, we set that aside in our capital projects fund. So the focus that I'm gonna spend all of my time on is on operating expenditures. Um, I do have a note here on capital projects, but everything I'm gonna really talk about is about operating because that's, that's really the, the meat of what we're talking about is running this district day to day. So, um, so we have our revenues and then we have expenditures. And then the difference between that is either a surplus or a deficit. If it's a positive number, it's a surplus. If it's a negative number, if it's a, it's a deficit. In general, we wanna avoid operating deficits. You, we, the reason we have a total deficit is because we're paying cash for these projects. So we have, the, we have the money in the bank already to pay for these projects. So that's why it, we have a negative almost 13 million is because we're paying cash for this big project. But operationally, day in and day out, we have a operating surplus of 600,000. Now, just a reminder that that number is not what I would say our true surplus is because we have we had made some intentional decisions in fiscal year 21 that if you weren't on the board here, you weren't part of that. One of the things that they did was refund school fees. And so that was to the tune of about a million dollars. Okay, and so that is already taken out of here. So in your mind, you can kind of think, well, instead of 600,000, maybe it was up a million, so it's 1.6 million, right? You can think about that. But then on the flip side, we had 500 grand of COVID expenses that we budgeted. So you could kind of think ahead, okay, take it down 500, so maybe 1.1 million, right? Um, we also had assumed transportation would be down a little bit because of less expenditures from the spring of 20, when everything kind of shut down, we had expenditures that were less and we get reimbursed. If you spend less and you're, your, your revenue is based on a reimbursement. Well, if you spend less, your reimbursement is going to be less, right? So, so, so we didn't really have a $600,000 um, surplus. It's, it's closer to a million, I would say, but we had a lot of little changes up and down because of the pandemic. So, but on paper, 600,000 is our starting place, all right? So that's what I want you to kind of think about in terms of that, all right? So that's fiscal year 21. No decisions to make about that. Um, we're gonna move on. Any questions about our fiscal year 21 budget? No, okay. All right. So next what I want to talk to you about is enrollment projections. So I do believe that our process is driven by the students. So let's talk about how many students we think are gonna be here next year. So this is a chart showing our enrollment back to 2016. Um, there are four lines here. Dan, why are there so many lines? Like, shouldn't there be just one line for our enrollment? That's the green line. The green line is our actual enrollment, but the blue, red, and yellow are Casarda projections. So we, we have used uh, John Casarda, a demographer, to project our enrollment for us. And what he does is he generates three scenarios. Casarda A, is the lowest possible you can expect. On the conversely, Casarda C is the highest possible you can expect. 
and B is what he says is most likely. Okay, so so you have his projections that were done in 20 or maybe close to 2016, 17. Um, or somewhere around there, maybe a year before, year after kind of thing, before me. So you can see how we've trended. So we have been floating a little bit above the B, but pretty close to the B. In 2021, that gap started to narrow, and I'm project projecting that in 21, 22, we dip slightly below the B projection, which just means we're really close to the B. That's all the takeaway. And the other takeaway is we're projecting about, I think we're gonna get about 30 more students than we have this year. A very small change to our overall 3,300 students, but still we're projecting it to go up a little bit, all right? So a little bit more students next year. Any questions on that? I have a question. Yeah. How often is this? How often is what activity? The demographic challenge you said. This With Casarda? Yeah. Um, I would say if the last time they did it in 2016, 17, and now it's 2021, how many years is that? Four years? Four or five years? I'd say four or five years because Casarda is doing it right now. Okay. He actually sent me a draft report on Thursday, but I'm still reading it, so I can't tell you yet, but I'm reviewing it. But that's long term. It, it, um, but yeah, so we do it about, I, I mean, it usually at least five years because his projections go out till 2026. Uh, they're, they're essentially 10 year projections, but because I saw like, are starting to lean down. And because I can see what the enrollments are at their feeder districts, I, I really wanted everyone to refresh. And this time we actually got almost all of our feeders to join in. So Hawthorne 73, 70, 68, everybody, we're all splitting the cost of this. And so it, that's great because it's 14 grand that we can all share the cost of this. So yeah, so we're getting those redone right now. Yeah, I was going to comment because we usually, we often do that in conjunction with the, the center district so that Yep. Not only we share the cost, but we share the same much of the same yeah. student population, so it makes sense to correct. Look yeah, at the the, the only exception was round out this time. Uh, they they didn't want to be part of it. They're very small, and they had just done their own projections, so they didn't feel it warranted for them to spend their money. And which we get totally makes twelve sense. to fourteen freshmen a year from seventy two. Yeah, so very small, out, very yeah. very small district, and so, and but and they were willing to share their projections with us. So we were able to incorporate that yep. with the information we gave to uh, Dr. Casarda. The, the other quick comment I'll make is, and I have nothing to do with Casarda, except for I've observed their demographic studies since the early nineties. And I'm amazed at how, just how accurate they are. Their, their, their B line is usually pretty close. And that's over a span of a lot of decades. And it's, yeah, I, I can't wait good. until kind of we have that report finalized um, for you to see it. It Right now it's about 100 pages long, but and it goes through each of our districts. And it, it's truly just a fascinating read on the demographics of both all of our feeders plus us as well, and both high schools too. So uh, stay tuned. But for next year, this is our anticipation for the number of students going up a little bit. Now, uh, COVID implications on our fiscal year 22 budget. So I would say there's a lot of implications. The biggest one is an analysis. What do we compare to? So typically what we've done is I will show you our fiscal year. So let's say if we were in a normal year, I would say here's our fiscal 22, 22 budget. Here's our fiscal 21 actual. So actuals from last year, I would compare that. And then also I'd give you a note on the comparison to last year's budget to analyze. And so just so, hey, we're gonna be up you know, 3% from what we spent last year in salaries or whatever. Um, but I can't do that this year uh, because uh, the, the pandemic skewed a lot of my actuals. So fiscal year 21, uh, some of that is skewed. Again, it's mostly down. Um, it's down in some salaries and supplies and services. It was also a little bit up because of COVID. We, we budgeted half a million in COVID expenditures for fiscal year 21. So that's not really a good accurate picture of running, let me say running a day-to-day -day school district in a normal year, like we always have, you know, like, like, we, like normal circumstances. Um, so the fiscal year 21 budget does not reflect that. So that's not really a good comparison for me to use. Our fiscal 21 budget actuals are terrible comparison um, because, you know, when we budgeted, we honestly, when we budgeted last August, we honestly did not know what was going to happen. So we had thought, 
I mean, when I was talking to the department soups, we thought, okay, let's say, what happens if we are hybrid for a couple months, then we go back into person full time. Like what, what do we, what do we do then? You know, and we were kind of talking through like, well, I don't think anybody's going to be going anywhere on like professional development. Like we're, we're probably not going to send anybody anywhere. Let's just kind of hold tight on some of the things we were going to do. Uh, so our actuals are skewed. The other reason is because our, our fiscal year is not done yet. So we've not done spending money and a lot happens in June. Um, that's when we wrap up. That's when we get a bulk of our property taxes. That's when we wrap up our spending for the fiscal year and we, we accrue. So we, we have a lot of expenditures in June that we accrue here, but we want, for instance, teacher salaries. So teacher salaries for July and August, we accrued now, but we don't send them the cash until July and August, but we accrue those expenditures now because we're a cruel basis because that's based on the pay they had for this school year. Um, so fiscal year 21, not a good comparison, um, objectively. And then fiscal year 20 actuals, even that is not a good comparison because a quarter of our year, we were shut down. And so you can see the line in our spending. I mean, you come to come to March, 2020, and it just tanks for a few months, right? Because we were totally shut down. Now, most of our salaries were intact because we were, we were forced to continue to pay everything. Um, but a lot of our supplies went down, like services, we just stopped spending, we stopped buying stuff, you know? The, everything shut down, right? So even fiscal year 20 for the whole year is not a fair comparison. So <laughs> I have difficulty in trying to figure out how do I show you numbers, but I need to give you context for those numbers, right? A wise person told me never show somebody a number without context. So otherwise it, it doesn't really mean anything. So I'm trying to find those, those valuable uh, comparisons. So let me give you an example of this. I'm gonna pick one line item in our budget that I think it should be pretty easy to walk this through. So this is food service chart wells. So we don't, we don't run our own food service program, but they're not our employees. It's chart wells that runs them. There are employees that are, that's their employees that are here running the food service program. So let's take, so I have budgeted, the green is the allocation, the temp, temp, uh, tentative allocation, $1.3 million, all right? So if I take our normal means of doing this, I would compare it to fiscal year 21 actuals. Well, if I did that, that's a 337% change. So it'd be like, Dan, are you crazy? Is your food service program growing over three times? That's crazy. And my answer would be, no, that's not, that's, not what's, that's not what's happening. Okay. Well, let's look at the budget sheet. How does it change from what we budgeted? Well, it's 116% different from what we budgeted last year. So like, hold on, our, our program is, you're budgeting for that to grow twice like it's gonna be two times what it was last year? Well, technically yes, but that's not what's really happening. Um, Cause if you can look at our actuals for fiscal year 20 right there, 1.1 million, all right? And then actuals for 2021, 300,000 because that's what our food service program was so far this year. So this is an example for me showing, this is not a true comparison for me to show you meaningful information because um, so let me talk about what I, what I'm recommending we use. And this is kind of what I built my presentation on. So if you don't like it, I guess we'll have to redo this. Um, but these are my recommendations in general. So for fiscal year, um, I recommend that we, we reference the fiscal 21 budget for some things, salaries and benefits. I think in general, that's a helpful thing to compare to, um, for some things because some of like teachers, administrators, ESP, <laughs> Well, one, one exception for ESP, those weren't adjusted because they were here and they were paid. Um, I would compare to fiscal year 20 bud budget, not the actuals because the actuals had a quarter year of down, but fiscal year 20 budget was the last time we had a plan for the full fiscal year to run everything five days a week, everything normal, like, like we would plan. So I'm gonna compare to that and then try to make some inferences two years later. The, the third one that I think is helpful maybe in some circumstances is to look at our fiscal year 19 actuals because that was the last fiscal year where we had the whole year of spending that happened as like happened. Uh, so now the other thing is because you're talking something three years ago, I have to do some adjustments for inflation because things aren't, don't cost the same as they did three years ago. So I have to make some assumptions on that. So that's essentially... 
um, what I'm recommending we compare to. So if we look at this same line again, but I now use those different comparisons, that's the second part here. So food service chart wells. So my allocation is still 1.3 million, but the change from the fiscal year 20 budget is, um, it's, it's, the, it's the same, sorry. Um, it, it's it's 100%, it's not double, sorry. 100% means it's the same. So let me rephrase what I said, 116% didn't mean, it means it's not going up 16, it's not even going up 16%. So it's going up back to where it was in fiscal year 20. So, and then if I use, what are the, what, how is it different from what we actually spent in fiscal year 2019? It's 3.6 more than what we spent three years ago. So if you can think in your head, okay, three years, that's more than what we spent three years ago. So if you take 3.6 divided by three, talking what 1.2% a year. And a lot of our food service costs is based on the kids that buy lunch. So if they buy more food here, we pay more. We also get fees because they pay for their lunches. So six in one, half dozen of the other. So this is why I'm saying, I think those numbers are overall a better comparison for a lot of things. <clears throat> but I need, I need to show you this because this is not normal. Like <laughs> we're in a weird year here, but I feel like I've been saying that for the last few years. <clears throat> um, any questions? Well, let me just summarize then. So in summary, I'm saying it's more difficult to compare <clears throat> our fiscal year 22 budget with our traditional comparisons we use. Fiscal year 21 is based on a return to normal, but it's been, it's been a few years since we've had normal and we're making some guesses on what normal costs. Uh, some things we know for sure, some things we don't know for sure. We have to kind of see what happens. So we have a plan and I'm gonna show you our plan. Um, and again, we're, we are three, we're gonna be three years away from our at last year full year actuals, which is fiscal year 19. So, I mean, that's a long time from really good, solid, full year data. Any questions on that? I have a question and maybe an idea or a thought. Have you looked, are our spending, is our expenditure pretty consistent quarter over quarter? Uh, we don't typically look at quarterly spending. It's really based on the fiscal year. Um, Part of the problem with that is um, we don't have consistent spending quarter to quarter. So for example, our first quarter for the first two months, there is no teacher salaries because those are already expended for last year. So those don't start, but then they start, they start at the end of August and they continue on. Uh, so the only thing really I could do is compare quarter one this year to quarter one last year, but I couldn't compare quarter, like quarter two and three would probably be similar close to each other but quarters one and four are kind of, there's, there's very little spending first quarter, very lot of spending fourth quarter. Okay. It probably doesn't matter because I was just wondering if one of the 20 later quarters in 20 could help you kind of match up and see if you're thinking you're aligned. Yeah, and we, we don't budget on a quarterly basis. So that, that would be extremely difficult okay. to try to figure out. That's not typically how the business is structured. It's typically structured around the fiscal year spending so because even each district can have slightly different so we're accrual but not every district is accrual um like libertyville 70 for example is cash so theirs is based on whatever money they actually spend that month so um but i think they do still, still do some accruals all right so that's that's the covid implications so now now that i think i've given you the tools i think we need to to really look at our fiscal year 2022 20, tentative budget so reminder this is operating funds. So I told you operating funds, but so the only other difference is capital projects fund. So the capital projects fund has really two expended two line items in there that we've already discussed. One of them is 750,000. That's what we still have remaining to pay on the additions ish based on our budget. Uh, it might end up be slightly less than that, but right now that's what's in there. And then $6 million for the field house. So if you may or may not recall, we agreed to $6.5 million for the field house. So Dan, why is it 6 million? Did we get like a group discount or something? We did not. We are gonna be end up spending about 500,000 this fiscal year on the field house. So when we're planning for everything, design costs. So we, we pay the architect when they design, we don't pay them when it's built, you pay them when they do the work. So just to give you a footnote on that. So that's really the capital projects fund. Everything else now I'm gonna be talking about. So there's, there's nothing else in our budget besides operating funds and the capital projects fund. Now I'm gonna spend all our time talking about um, operating funds. Here is 
uh, the chart and sheet that looks, it's the same structure as the fiscal year 21. And so what I'm, what I'm really gonna focus you here on is the operating surplus. So right now we are sitting at an operating surplus of $153,900. So operating revenues of $94,802,200 and then expenditures of $94,648,300, okay? So here's the first takeaway. The first takeaway is it's not deficit. The law, state law requires us to pass a balanced budget, meaning it has to, it can't be negative there. All right. And if it is negative, you actually have to file a plan with the state to show how you're going to be positive within three years. Um, so that's your first takeaway. But for all these other numbers, like I need to give you context for them. So that's what the rest of my slides are is to explain this. Okay. But right now, we take away 150, 150, call it 154,000 operating surplus. Okay, now let's look closer at revenues. And I'm going to give you context for those major summarized numbers and give, give you context based on what we talked about. So property taxes. Property taxes, this is where I'm saying you, so the, the green is the actual number that I have budgeted. The yellow is the comparison number that I think is useful to use. So we are budgeting a 2.73% increase in property taxes. Um, part of that is, um, part of that is multiple levies. So I don't, know, I don't think we've talked much yet about levies uh, with our new board, but we levy taxes every uh, December. November, December, the, our fiscal year is based on two different levies. So this budget right now is based on our 2020 levy, which was done in December of 2020. And it's based on the 2021 levy, which is coming this November. So I'm making assumptions about that levy, but I know the numbers that go into that levy. So part of that numbers is, is CPI, the rate of inflation. I, knew, I know that already. So I'm building that assumption in there. Um, so that is the combination of, and so the CPI for one of them is 2.3. The CPI for the other one is 1.4. So you really blend those. You can blend those and divide by two, I guess. You're closer to, I don't know, 1.8, 1.9. Then you have new properties. So people are, they're building more stuff in our district. Uh, a lot of people are renting their own houses. I don't know if you did. I added a deck onto my house. So now my assessment's going to go up. Um, so, so there's new property getting added on every year. In addition we've had increased collections. And so um, we, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but um, some of you will remember, actually Jim was the only one here, but I've talked to you all about it before. Maybe not with the new board, I can't remember, I'm sorry, is uh, tax rate objections. So we had tax rate objections that are court filed that we were, essentially paying back a million dollars a year in taxes. And I told the board when I got here, like, this is not something we need to keep continuing to do. Like we, there, we, can, we can fix this, but it, it'll take me a few years to balance out our fund balances amongst our funds. Cause our total fund balance was, was within legal limits, but the per fund one was off. It was definitely off, but I told them we can fix that. On thir Wednesday or Thursday, we got our final distribution settlement from the county where as three or four years ago, it was a million dollars a year. This year in 2019, it was zero. So, which is great news. So all that means is that we are, we are, we are now realizing a million more dollars than we would have otherwise. Let me say it back a different way. If we did not do this, we would have a deficit of like 800,000. Okay. So every little bit counts. So th th I just want to give you kind of perspective on that. So that, that's really exciting, really great. So we're going to get more of the taxes that we, we're, you know, really allowed to get rather than paying that back because you don't, you don't really need to do that. So, so we've kind of fixed that. Um, so that's property taxes. That is by far the bulk of our money um, that goes up. So you can see that number there. That is the biggest source of revenue for us. So also local sources. So local sources are really stuff that comes from the community and it's not a state source or a federal money. So that's what local really means. Uh, CPPRT, uh, I, 
I could spend a whole day seminar on revenues for you all, but I'll spare you. So I'm going to try to be brief because there's so much here. So I, I need to spend more time explaining some of this stuff. And maybe what I should do is kind of put together something that y'all can read when on your own leisure rather than putting everybody through because I think everybody's heard me explain some of this stuff many times. CPPRT it stands for Corporate Personal Property Replacement Taxes. There was a, there was a personal property tax uh, back in the 70s um, that was abolished and it was replaced with a, with a tax coming from income from companies. So that personal property tax went away and it was replaced, CPP, our replacement tax, it was replaced with this state tax that the state handles, Illinois Department of Revenue handles, and they send us the money. Um, so that one, for example, that one I've got up 21%. That's a little bit of a mis misnomer because what I had done is I had budgeted that this was going to go down. So remember last year, pandemic was down. We were assuming everything is going to be going down. So I'm assuming money that I get based on what business income is, I must, sounds like everything is going to say business income is going down. I'm gonna assume the money I get based on that is gonna go down. So we, we had picked uh, 788,000, which was around the number that we got at the low point of the great recession. <clears throat> when that was happening, uh, you know, a, probably almost a decade ago, that low point, um, that's kind of where we were. So I, I put it there because this seemed like this was gonna be as bad, if not worse than that point. Uh, little did I know that, that that did not end up happening. Um, we got, so far, we've gotten $1.2 million this year. So a lot of us are like, what happened? Because the state also gives us estimates. So we said, what's, what's happening? Why, why did we get so much more? And the first, they're like, well, I don't know. Uh, but the second, second answer they gave us was what they believe is that a lot of businesses perhaps were going to be down, but because of the stimulus money, a lot of them were able to either, they were able to access stimulus money, which produced more income for them, or they, were, or they weren't as impacted by that. And so that's why it went up. So the idea is that this is probably a one-year increase, but it's not going to be like this next year because the idea is this, this, this is not going to be there for next year. So I have this lowered back down from what we received down to about 950000 So more than what I budgeted last year, but not quite as, I don't think we're going to get the same amount as what we got this year. All right, I'm going to move a little faster now because the rest of these aren't as big of numbers. Uh, tuition. So tuition is that we don't we don't charge tuition for students. So what tuition is that summer school, that's summer camps. So all the athletic camps, whatever. That's we charge it under there, and then our adult education program. So the community education adult ed program. That's where that comes in. Um, essentially, what I'm assuming there that's down a little bit because I'm assuming that that program doesn't fully recover next year. I think it comes back a fair amount, but I don't think it's going to be back 100% next year. Transportation fees is really not anything material that we get. That's for summer school transportation, but most of those students uh, get it for free. So I don't really anticipate any money from that. Interest income is probably the saddest thing. Um, I was really excited when I got here, we had been getting about 600,000 in interest income. Two years ago, we got it up to two and a half million, which is really exciting. But we've been spending down the fund balance because we've been doing these projects, but also rates have been absolutely terrible. Mm. So we budgeted for six, 670,000. Fiscal year's not done yet, so we've only gotten 470, but I think we're going to we're going to be a little bit over 500 I think by the time the year is done. So I'm not going to hit the 670 that I was hoping for. Uh, so I'm assuming we're going to be kind of similar to where we were this year. Similar amount of money, but hopefully maybe rates recover a little bit. I don't know, but this is something long term that I I don't see a lot of growth in unless rates turn around substantially. So that's that. Uh, food service, um, this is a one. So this is the revenue side of the expenditure. I've got this at 1.2 million because I think it, I'm hoping it goes almost back to normal. 1.2 million, uh, 1.3 million would be normal. Um, I'm assuming it's not quite there. I'm going to be a little bit more conservative on that number, but um, there, there's some risk there. We don't know, but it's also tied to the expenditures. So um, if, if, by the time we get to a final, if I think, you know, really it's gonna be a million, then I would adjust the expenditure as well. Activities, this is a big one. And so this really is a legit big increase um, for both activities and textbooks uh, because those were the student fees that we, so last, th this fiscal year, we returned the fees 
that we collected. So essentially not charging the fees. The, the plan for next year is we're, we're charging our normal fees that we would normally charge in a year. So that is that is the difference that you see. So when I said it was a million, you know, you can add those together, a little bit over a million actually. So um, yeah, that's what I'm, no, yeah. Yeah, a little bit over a million. So that's essentially what I'm accounting for there. And uh, yes, that would be a 72,000% increase mathematically, but it's more of a return to normal is what I would say. Other local, I'm assuming basically flat, similar to what we had uh, in the previous years. That's been pretty consistent. So overall on local sources, 4.5% increase, but it's not really 4.5% increase because some of that is we're just returning to normal. Um, it's not it's not our true increase. I would say our true increase is closer to the 2.7% based on the property taxes because that's the biggest bulk of our money that's consistent. So once I get actuals done for fiscal year 21, I'll be able to drop in better numbers. I should ask any questions on local sources. Okay. All right, state and federal. So this, these are the other sources of our revenue. So if you'll notice, there's not many places we get revenue from, but there's all kinds of ways that we spend the money. Um, same with your house, right? Think about yourself. How many sources of income do you have versus how many ways do you spend it, right? Um, if I run my own checking account report, the money's in, there's not a lot of them, but the money's out, there's a lot of them on the list. So the, our major source of state funding is evidence-based funding. So that is the main way that, that the state allocates money for education. It um, essentially calculates um, how much money the, the district needs based on their own calculations. They're very, there's nothing you can really do to control that source of revenue. Um, but because we have so much hype, we're such, we're, a very wealthy district, um, we essentially just get the same amount we got last year. So, and then any new money really goes more to those less fortunate districts. Um, less, yeah. So, um, so I'm assuming that's flat. We'll, we'll get a little bit more, I'd say. Special ed, uh, this is private facility reimbursement. Uh, coming later, I'm gonna talk to you about more students that are being privately placed. Um, and so we actually get a little bit of reimbursement. So if we have more students privately placed, we'll get a little bit more reimbursement on that. Um, those other items, CTE, which is career and technical education uh, from the state, I'm assuming that's flat. That's been pretty consistent over the years. Same with driver's ed, we get some money for that. That's been pretty consistent, flat. Transportation, this is a kind of a big change. Uh, that's down 26%. And that's really just because the reimbursement is based on your expenditures. So this year our transportation is projected to be down so next year there's less to reimburse. So our revenue, so it's gonna be a little weird because our expenditures are gonna assume transportation costs return to normal, but our revenue is gonna be down because it's a one year lag. So a year from now, I'm hoping that I can sit here and tell y'all, hey, look, transportation is going up 300 grand because we're kind of back to normal. So this is, this is a revenue item that's gonna take another year before we're back to normal. Uh, other state is flat, pretty consistent. Um, that's a library grant. For some reason, I did not budget that last year, but uh, that is something that we are gonna get. Summer food service program, that's new. That's a federal program that we got last year that we're gonna be able to get this year, but after that, it's gonna be done. And so I'm guessing on the low end, $30,000 for that um, to run our food summer food service program. Um, <clears throat> uh, Title IV, uh, I'm estimating is flat. IDEA grant, that is um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that is federal funding for special, special education, special services, we call it here. Um, that is going up because there's two components. There's, and there's, there's more information in a lot of the, some of the attachments, but there is, there's a Part B flow through, which is just a base chunk of money they allocate to us. And the second component is a reimbursement for room and board. So if you have students that are residentially placed, uh, in, a, in a facility, um, there is a, there's, a state that, there's a state program that reimburses us some of that cost. And so, I'm, so we're projecting more of those students. And so I'm therefore also projecting I'm gonna get a little bit more money back to offset that cost. <clears throat> then there's Perkins, which is tied to uh, CTE. That's the federal uh, tie-in. Um, that's gonna be flat as my projections. And then finally is other federal so that's gonna include Title II, that's gonna include Medicaid, and the big one is gonna be ESSER three. So ESSER three is the COVID relief package that was done under the 
Biden administration. So there's there were three packages, SRS one, two, and three. SR one was very early on in the pandemic. Um, that was about 60,000 for us. SR two was done in December. So in the Trump administration that was done, that was about 200,000 for us. The SR three um, that will open up on July 1st, um, that'll be about 526,000. That's the number I checked just a, a couple of days ago. So I'm gonna double check that number before we're final, but that essentially includes that. So that is obviously going up a significant amount, but that's based on what we're expecting to get. Now, that is one-time money. So you can think back in your head, okay, he said $153,000 surplus. We're getting an extra 500 grand one year. So you can kind of bring that down. But then also transportation, he said, is actually down 360 grand. So like bringing that back up, right? So we have a little bit of this going on. So, um, so overall total revenues up 4.7. That's the bottom right-hand corner, up 4.7%. That, that is not a real 4.7. So we don't, we're not going to have a raw increase of revenue of 4.7. We technically will, but we're returning to normal. It's not because we're just getting, we're finding all these more revenues. We're returning to normal. So what I can't do is pretend like I can't build the 21 budget assuming that was normal and then compare you to what this new normal is. That's going to be too hard to do. Um, but what I would say is our actual, so th this is on paper 4.7. That is, that is mathematically true. But I'm telling you realistically, our real, if you look at all these things, they're either flat or down a little bit, right? Look at all those other, those other things. They're either flat or down a little bit, maybe up a little bit. But the ones that are really up, it's because we're returning to normal, not because we're we're finding more revenue. So I, my argument is what I'm saying is I think our, our real increase is closer <laughs> to that 2.6 number, which is 2.7 rounded down a little bit because it's not all of our money. I think that's more a realistic number of what our revenues are really increasing by um, because you need to keep that in mind for the trend. So what you don't want to have is a long-term trend of your revenues increasing by 2%, but your expenditures increasing by 4%. You're going to run out of money at some point, right? Okay, so that's revenues. Any questions on revenues? You guys doing okay? You're right? Okay. I'm sorry, there's a lot here, but I don't know how else to explain this to you. Other than I can just tell you the totals, but there's, there's a stories here to each of these. It's way better having you go over it than just us looking at these numbers today. Right, yeah, so, I was so looking at I'm, these numbers I'm, and thinking, we'll look at some of them like, <laughs> I'm so glad Dan's gonna go over this. What I'm hoping is to give you the tools to how to read that stuff. Right. So, um, but I at least wanted to get some of it in your hands in case some of you wanted to read it and familiarize yourself with it. All right, so salaries, expenditures. So expenditures, I'm gonna go through different sections. So salaries, um, those are monies that we pay to our employees. So the biggest chunks are gonna be administrator salaries, teacher salaries, and ESP, our support staff salaries. Those are the biggest chunks of our permanent employees. Then we have, um, the other big category I would say is like our stipends. So I've, I've tried to summarize this up. So in your, in your handout has all of them kind of split out. That's too many to fit on one slide. So I, I summarize the rest of them kind of into an all other. So let me walk through these major components. So administrator salaries up. So this is one where you can use a change from the budget. I think that is a good number to use. So that's up 6%. <clears throat> you say, Dan, it's crazy what's happening. Are you giving your administrator 6% raises? No, that's not what's happening. We have added two administrator positions for next year. That's why it's up 6%. Um, the the transi transition program supervisor. So that's our, that's our special education program for 18 to 22 year olds that, that, are, that are guaranteed services by federal law. Um, it's to run that because we're gonna launch that in fiscal year 23. So this is hiring that person to build that program ready to launch next year. Uh, the other one is the addition of the dean or uh, t uh, team leader here at Vernon Hills added added that in, so that's really what takes up the administrator. So that and Dan, that and that's a result of the enrollment growth over the last three years at Vernon Hills from thirteen fifty to sixteen hundred. Yeah, so part of that is the LST. So our LST model. So there's three at L there's three at um, LHS. There's been historically two at Vernon Hills, and so we've been slowly kind of building because there's a, a number of people involved in an LST. So rather than just hand over an LST, it's a, that's a big jump. 
um, and kind of slowly building it based on the enrollment. So that's something we look at every year, like how is this growing and what, what are the little components we need to keep adding to eventually, based on the students, you need to grow to that third LST. Um, so that's administrator sal that's administrator salaries. Uh, teacher salaries um, is at 2.8%. So that's the combined impact of adding um, essentially one, I think one FTE on the teacher side, uh, but then you know, the, the raises offset by the retirements. Um, so 2.8, so that seemed within kind of the realm of what I was expecting. Um, ESP salaries. This is one I'm not, I'm not so comfortable with. I, so mathematically it's working at a 9.3%, but I need to, I'm reviewing this. So we had some ESP that were down this last year because of the pandemic, some were laid off for a period of time, some for a long time. And so the plan is for them to be totally restored back to where their same roles and hours and all that kind of stuff for next year. So, so there's some of that in here, um, but I don't know that it makes up the whole 9%. So I, this is something I'm still working on and reviewing, but right now we're looking at the list. And so, oh, by the way, when we, when we budget these, this is, this is, we have a list of every name we have. So I have a, the spreadsheets of, Every name, what they make, what their what all the benefits are, what those cost, everything kind of spread out, account numbers tagged and everything. So we have a list that we think accounts for every single ESP. So we're kind of reviewing that list because there's a lot of Brian, is it fair to say there's a lot of ESP changes that we're trying to navigate through? Mm -hmm. So um, and so normally um, you know, from this timeline, we look at doing ESP staffing in uh, May, uh, we're actually going to talk about it um, next week and kind of review that. So because of the pandemic, because of last year, there were some of our ESP when we went over this last year, um, because students weren't in the building, there weren't as many monitors needed in the building. So we reduced um, some of those positions and then we slowly brought them back when we went to hybrid. Some ESP also chose not to come back due to the pandemic, but obviously we need a lot of those positions back. But, uh, you know, I'll get into a little bit more detail uh, next week. We also looked at um, some of those positions and make sure we had an extensive review since we have so many, we had so many openings on the, the necessity of those positions. And we've changed some, um, I think, scope of the job descriptions and other things to get better usage uh, for our students and our staff. So we have that opportunity to do that, um, but there's no increase in from the previous year of our number of ESP in the building. We were able to add some positions that were needed. We got rid of some positions that were not needed, but the overall staffing of ESP was basically so when Dan looks at an increase, you know, it's hard because we did have that you know, layoff, not layoff, but I mean, some people were just, uh, you know, furloughed, in other words, furloughed for a while and then brought back. So. so, and we did account for some of that in the budget for fiscal year 21. So that's why, like, I, I need to review this because because this is affecting a number of other benefit lines. Um, so, so stay tuned. Um, I'm hoping this is a little bit high right now. It's not going to be higher than this. So I'm hoping this is a little high and I can bring down, but I have to find the name, you know, I have to find the position that shouldn't be there. So far, we can't find the one, we can't find them. Um, all right, so then we have performance bonus. So that it, that is, you know, that's not guaranteed, but I'm assuming that that's paid out. That's the one and a half percent uh, based on the contract um with the teachers and everything so that that's going up relative to everybody that's eligible so that doesn't grow at the same rate the other ones do because you can't be new and get it you have to be here for at least a year in order to be part of that process so uh, those are my projections for that and then again that that's i have every name attached to that so every new position gets nothing because they're new every person that was here that is still here i have on that list so is there okay, it's okay. Go. um so the vacation buyback, that one is was a little weird. It went up because last year we had a pandemic. And so a bunch of people that are able, able to take that did. So I'm assuming that kind of goes down uh, next year. And then really everything else, you can see in the list, all of those line items and what the explanation is. But in general, you're seeing two things. One, a return to normal. So overtime, rentals, 
stipends, extra duties, events, all this other stuff that we pay for, kind of reverting back to normal. But then on the flip side is the five days extra that we paid this year, that that's not continuing next year. So you can think of it like we're going up, um, we're going up, call it 600,000 in return to normal, but we're going down 800,000 in that five days payment. So that's essentially what's happening in the all of their for, for a total change on salaries of 3.5. So based on everything that I know, what I can see on teacher salaries, administration, and maybe ESP, 3.5 looks like the number, looks like a realistic number to me um, based on our staffing, okay? And returning to normal. So that's salaries, I'm sorry. Any questions on salaries? Okay. So in, in so with salaries, the next are benefits. So there's a lot of, obviously different benefits. Some, you know, if you've ever worked, maybe you didn't know that you had these benefits because these are not monies sometimes that people know about, but we still pay them. So I'm gonna kind of list, re review these for you. Uh, TRS is the cost that we pay into the teacher's retirement system, which is the pension system for teachers and most of our administrators. Um, so that one I have going up 9.29%. I actually think that one is accurate or pretty close to accurate, but some of these, what I need to do is I need to wait and see what the actuals turn out to be. And then I can, I'll know better. Um, so this is one that I really need to see how the fiscal year ends to really get a better understanding because these numbers seem a little high to me on the calculations. But again, it's every person on a name with formula and we check the formulas, they look right. So we got to kind of look at this. What would drive that number to be higher, Dan? Uh, the biggest thing that drives that number to be higher is um, there is in terms of the budget. So if you're talking about budget change, okay. if you look at the actual change, it's a lower number in that handout I gave you, change from actual. Uh, I think the reason is, is um, for anybody that is paid higher than the governor's salary, um, there is an additional contribution we have to make to the pension system. Um, and so overall last year, that was like 85,000. I totally forgot to budget that last year. So I do not forget this year. And so I have it in there now, which that is, I think the reason why it bumps it up to nine on the budget. If you look at the actuals, it's lower. And once I see the, the reality shake out. So I think, I think TRS is pretty accurate, but we're still reviewing. I want to wait and see the fiscal year end up. IMRF is the Illinois Municipal Retirement System. That is the pension system for our support staff. So if I've got ESP going up 9%, the IMRF is going to go up by a similar amount. The one difference is our IMRF rate, the rate we use changes every year. So sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. So th that can impact uh, us as well. Um, so and it's just to ex explain why that is, um, where it's different than TRS. Yeah. T okay. Because uh, they have, they have to be solvent. Sure. Yeah. So TRS is a state pension system that has the way they get money is from members. So teachers contribute, they get deductions from their paycheck. 9%. Every teacher has to, they don't have a choice, has to pay 9% into this pension system. And we have to by law deduct that. So teacher contributions, interest income and state funding. And they get a little bit of money from us. On average, we spend about 0.58%, 0.58% on teacher salaries towards this pension system. So it's small. Um, it's paid for higher levels for different employee types, but in general, it's very small. Um, so that's, that's that portion. For IMRF, uh, the, the, the payments are employees contribute 4.5%. So if you work if you work in IMRF, you're a support staff, you have to get deducted four and a half percent, which is half as much as TRS, right? Four and a half percent. Um, then the state contributes nothing. They have interest income, and then we have to kick in the difference, which ranges between ten and eleven percent every year, and it's based on the actual cost of it. So technically, what happens is we have our own pension system for IMRF that they manage for us for our ESP. And so that rate will be unique for each district and will vary based on the actual people, the, the pensioners, pen, pensioners, pensioners um, that are on the rolls at that time. So that rate will change every year. <clears throat> sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. 
So if ESP in, in, are increasing, IMRF is going to correspondingly increase. Same with FICA, same with Medicare. Um, now, to, so teachers don't pay into FICA. So this is also a helpful thing that people don't realize. Teachers not pay into social security. They do not get deducted the 6.2%. They can't get social security when they retire. They get the pension system. Uh, so they don't pay and we don't pay. But IMRF we do. So IMRF, they're both in social security and in the IMRF system. So, so we have to do both. So FICA will go up more meaningfully um, because that is purely ESP. So why is that higher than normal? I'm not totally sure. I think maybe it just had a budget low, but I got to see how the actuals turn out for FICA. Medicare, everybody pays Medicare. Teacher, support staff, administrator, everyone. So that 5.8% is a blend of the teacher increases, the ESP increases, and the administrator increases, and everything else increases. So that's a blend. So I'm looking into that. THIS um, is 5.8. That's more consistent with the administrator and teacher stuff. Um, that's what I think po possibly we might be at with TRS had I not missed that $85,000. Um, so we're looking at that again. I want to see how the year ends up and I can reevaluate. So I shouldn't, I should then tell you what THIS is. So THIS stands for the Teacher Health Insurance Fund. This is a state requirement, uh, state mandate. We don't have a choice. This is the fund that pays for insurance for retired teachers. So we have to pay that in. We have to pay. <coughs> Bless you. It's like, it's close to 1%. It changes every year. It's close to 1%, I think, that we have to pay on teachers uh, for towards this. And then they have a deduction too. So they have a deduction. Um, I don't remember what their deduction is, but they, they have to pay into it as well. And we have to pay a portion. <clears throat> so that should end up going up similar to TRS. The one difference is there's no penalty uh, if you are paying more than the governor's salary. And the other thing with the governor's salary is when you have a, a billionaire that doesn't really need a salary, they've kept it flat. And so like, so then the difference kind of grows and that just makes it worse. So they finally increased his for this next year. So that mitigates the impact of that. <clears throat> Medical insurance um, is a problem. And I, I have to look more into this. Um, it should not be 10%, but I need to see how the fiscal year ends up um, <clears throat> because our, our premiums are only increasing 3.6 and we're not adding enough staff to mean that it should be at, at 9% or 10%. So I need to come back, but again, we're it's based on people and every name and a position ha is there. So I need to come back. I would like to improve this a little bit, but I don't think it should be 6 million, uh, but I, ha I have to kind of relook at this. So I, at some point I have to kind of stop trying to find it and just, freeze everything and then summarize it, analyze it, present it to you and kind of do all that other stuff. So I froze it at that moment at a 10%, but it, I don't think it'll be that high, but I have to come back to you later. <clears throat> but I would love to be able to improve on that by like 200,000 would be, I think more realistic, but I, I don't know yet. Um, retiree insurance uh, is, there's a very small portion that's flat. Uh, tuition reimbursement, um, you can see in your handout, we've actually had a sustained um, increase in our tuition reimbursement. We've, for a number of years, we've been between 15, 60,000. The last two years, we've been between 90 and 100,000. So I've got two years of that. So I'm sticking with the higher number. That A lot of that changed with our new teacher contract. Both it was an increase in that benefit, but also I think more people became aware of it. And the pandemic gave, gave some people a lot of extra time to do that. So I don't think we'll be quite as high as this current year because I'm hoping people just kind of relax, but maybe they do take more, we'll see. Dental insurance is the same story as medical insurance. So everything I said about med medical is the same thing for dental. Um, so I'm reviewing that. 43B contributions, that one is correct. Uh, so our match, <clears throat> right now we match a dollar for dollar match up to $750. Not a ton of money, I know, but Per employee, it adds up to several hundred thousand. Um, so that that is growing to a thousand dollars. That decision was already made. So that is growing to a thousand dollars next year based on our teacher's contract. And so I have that accounted for uh, in there. Um, and not everybody does it. We, so far, we found about eighty percent of so of employ eligible employees participates. We try to encourage more, but for a variety of reasons, they 
don't choose to do that. Um, so I'm assuming that around similar percentage of people don't choose to do that. And again, I have a list of names. So if I know the last two years you've not participated, I'm gonna assume you're not participating. But if you participated the last three years, I'm gonna assuming you're gonna keep participating. So that's how we build that. So that is a real, that is the real number there. Uh, Post-retirement benefits, uh, that is totally based on people that are actually retiring that year. So that is up, but that's based on the actual retirees every year. So that, that number will go up and down significantly based on the actual retirees. So that, that, is, that is a known number. And then unemployment uh, is, I'm, I'm predicting it's a little bit down because we're not in a pandemic anymore and I'm assuming less unemployment. Now we, we get unemployment claims, I don't know, every day, every other day, once a week uh, for a variety of reasons. Most of them aren't real. Um, so we have to kind of navigate through that. So I'm expecting that done. So overall benefits at 10%. I think that's too high, but I need to review it and come back to you. Any questions on benefits? We're almost there. Okay. Good. You're doing great. All right. Departments. So we have salaries, we have benefits. That's our staffing. The rest is this big chunk of all of our departments. So our major departments, uh, I summarize LHS and Vernon Hills as a department because it's, they're really big. And so I kind of give you the totals, but inside LHS is English and math and science and social studies, though, you know, all of those physical welfare, um, athletics, all that stuff is built into LHS and Vernon Hills. So um, then we have a lot of district departments. So let me talk about Vernon Hills and LHS um, because those are, those are significant. So. We've talked before that next year is a return to normal. So this is where all the stuff that I had told you is gonna really come into play. Um, so for example, for LHS and Vernon Hills, if you look in the data that, that you guys have, you will see that their budget from fiscal year 20 to 21 went down. It went down about 170,000 at LHS and it went down about 100,000. So rather than going up like a 2% that it, whatever it would normally go up, it went down because we adjusted stuff for pandemic. We decreased travel. We knew that was going to happen. We decreased a lot of stuff, field trips, you know, that stuff's not going to happen. Busing is going to go down, that kind of stuff. So, um, so next year is kind of like a return to normal. So when you look at the pure numbers, LHS is going up 10.29%. That is, that is the true number on paper, but I don't think that that is a fair comparison. If, um, if I look at the change from the fiscal year 20 budget, so again, the last year that we had a real budget for them, it's a 3.2% increase. So 3.2% increase over from something two years ago, that's not bad, you know, in terms of costs. Additionally, um, one of the things we're, we're doing is we're buying some more driver's ed cars. We're replacing our driver's ed cars. So I mentioned to you before, this is the first time I've worked at high school district. This is my fourth year here, but since I've been here, no one has asked me about driver's ed cars. So I was super curious how this happens because I don't know, I've never worked at a high school district. This is the first year that I got contacted and said, hey, our cars are getting old. Like, when are we getting new ones? And so I said, like, I don't know. How do you usually get them? And the, what I was told is my predecessor just got them cars. I'm like, okay, well, let's budget for it. Uh, so that's, we're budgeting for two replacements at each, at each building. They have three cars. Um, so we're budging, budging for replacement for two at each building. And so that's part of their budget because that's part of the driver's ed program is the cost of those cars. I'm not going to just charge it to like B&G or something. It's part of that program. So if I take away the driver's ed cars, so if I don't, that because that's that wasn't really LHS and Vernon Hills decisions. That was just a, a structural thing we need to do. If I take away the driver's ed cars, for example, LHS is almost flat from what it was two years ago almost flat. And that is, that was not a, you need to be at this number. This was a, a natural evolution of their process got them there. Um, Vernon Hills, similarly, um, first blush, 13.5% increase by compared to the budget from fiscal year 20, it's a 7.6% increase over two years. So you're talking, you know, close to 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 almost. Um, but if I take away the driver's ed cars, again, don't, don't count that against them because that is something really totally new. 4.1% um, from two years ago. So that's about a 2% increase per year. In my opinion, that's reasonable. Um, 
this was a this was a building that they had to work at it. The first first blush through the numbers were a lot higher, and John had to kind of do some careful work to try to get that number even down. So I do feel that we're at a reasonable place for Vernon Hills, um, but those are kind of difficult to navigate, especially because. We don't exactly know how much everything is going to actually cost next year. We're, we're, this is an estimate based on everything planning, the trips they're going on, the services they want to buy, the office supplies they want to purchase, you know, the, the, the memberships that we're paying for, the professional learning that they plan on going on, all that stuff is kind of built in. Does um, increased enrollment drive building expenses up? It absolutely can. Uh, so we do have a little bit, but um, sometimes it can, it depends on where the enrollment is and what programs they're in. Um, we've seen some programs grow, and so that's reflected. We've some, seen some programs not grow or go down, and we've also reflected that. Um, like, for example, music was a particular department that was a little bit difficult, less participation. So, for example, then the building kind of working with me, we allocated less money for music because there's less kids to buy music for, so you're you, so you're naturally going to buy less music, for example. Those are the kind of things that we kind of navigate through together. So those are the, those are the bulk of it. Those are the two buildings. So I, I think those, my, my professional opinion is I think those are in reasonable places. Uh, everything else uh, is kind of listed there for you. I'm not really going to hit on many of it. The one I do want to touch on is special services. I guess unless there's any questions, but special services is significant. So that is um, our students with special needs program. The largest component of that money is tuition that we pay, pay to students that are placed in other facilities, not ours, that we have to pay tuition for. So we have seen there are more, there, there have been more kids and the idea is that more are coming. Um, so we also did, the, but the other part is we're not done with this fiscal year. We had also thought that more kids were gonna come this year I don't know that we realized all those kids, but honestly, at the end of the day, you're, you're guessing, you're truly guessing. I mean, you try to use an informed guess, like here are the names of kids. Here's where they are. Here's the kids that we think are coming here based on they're at, they're at the feeder schools. We know their names. We know where they are. Mm -hmm. We're assuming they come here and continue in the same thing perhaps. So we do those assumptions. Um, so that is up 4.73%, which, is, is pretty high for us, um, but it's based on the kids. And again, you can easily have a $130,000 kid show up like that. So the, being down like three kids can be a significant amount of money. Yep. But the other, there's two other things that are pretty important here that we have to keep in mind. There are two bills that, I don't know if Pritzker signed them yet, but there, he might, or he has time to, or there might be, he might've signed them or they're on his desk. I'm not totally sure to be honest. One of them is, so the transition program I told you about, it's the 18 to 22. So the normal rule is they can be part of this program until the day before their 23rd birthday. Okay. So let's say you turn 23 in December, you're, you done, you're done with our program in December. That's how it's been for a long time. The law that is on his desk is to say, it, you finish the school year. So no matter if your birthday is in September, you finish the school year. Um, and so there's a lot of support around that idea. Uh, and I get it. Um, that seems like he's going to sign it. All right. So that will just naturally increase our cost. So rather than kids, maybe we only pay for a few months of tuition. Now you're going to have to pay the full year hmm. that they're in. So that is just a raw increase. And there's no funding that was put in to offset any of that. We just have to eat that. But again, we're, we're a very, <coughs> we're a very fortunate district. I don't know that others are gonna be less fortunate to be able to do this. So that's one part of it. The second part, which is um, a little more interesting, this is a one-time thing though, is there's also a law um, that, or a bill on his desk ready to sign that essentially said, if you were a student that, grad, that aged out of the transition program this past year, because of the pandemic, you get a one-year do-over. So even though you aged out, no matter what, you can do a one year do over. So you can get another year of school. So that's one that we're still waiting to sign. We don't totally know what's gonna happen, but you probably will sign that. So, so we know of kids, we know their names that transitioned out of our program that could 
be allowed to come back for a whole another year of, of service. So uh, we don't know yet. So what I have in here is, I don't have that in here. So what I have in here is the full year. So it's up because of the full year plus like maybe one kid, but I do not have the kids coming back. Let me guess, this is also an unfunded mandate. It is technically unfunded, but it's a one year unfunded. So that's a lot easier than a forever unfunded. Um, what some have said is, oh, you can use your ESSER money perhaps for this. We'll see, um, don't know yet. And Dan, um, for anybody that may be watching, just quickly explain the ESSER money, the federal money. Sorry, ESSER money is the federal COVID relief money. Um, we talked about it in the revenues portion, so we're lying like 20 minutes. Um, yeah, so that's the COVID relief, 526,000 we're gonna get next fiscal year, one-time money. Uh, so they're saying you could use that to offset. So we're estimating that cost could be somewhere between, I would say 200 and 400,000, one-time money, but it's the kids have to wanna come back too. So say they're transitioned from their program, you, you have to invite them back, but maybe they decide not to, I don't know, so, so we don't know. Um, but, but it could be in the range of 200 to 400,000. So if you're kind of thinking in your head, remember that surplus I told you about, like that could be gone instantly because of that, but that's one-time money. So I'm not as concerned about that. The permanent year thing, that's, that's a more real thing that we have, we don't have a choice. So, um, so overall increase on all of our departments, 7.96 which is a very significant increase. However, in my opinion, a lot of this is we're reverting back to our normal year. Right. Um, which again, we're normal year based on something we don't totally know what all the actual costs will be because it, the last time we had this comparable data was two years ago. So yeah, so percentage change from fiscal year 20 budget, it's 6.2. So, I mean, that makes it sound a little bit better, um, but but the biggest difference is the buildings reverting to normal and this more out of place students is significant, which adds to all the more why we believe that doing our own transition program is gonna be better, not only for the student, like it's a better, it's gonna be a better program for our students and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a better allocation of the resources. So that's all the departments, all right? Um, COVID. So we have our own line for COVID expenditures. So this is a weird thing. So let so this year we budgeted half a million. We've spent so far 1.2 million. Uh, so that's a lot. Dan, why did you only budget half a million? That's because when we did budget, we did not anticipate uh, we would do our testing program, which has been called half a million dollars. Uh, so that was that we didn't know we were going to do that in August. You know, we kind of worked on that throughout the fall. So that was part of our program. We knew that, the board approved that, all that stuff. Uh, so what happens next year? What are we gonna do? I don't know. That's my honest answer. I know for sure we have got 50,000 that we have to spend. Our thermal scanners, when we bought them, part of buying them was a two year software agreement. So we have to pay that second year. That's part of our contract with them. So I for sure have to pay them that. But beyond that, I don't know. Or, so I have to put a number in there. I right now I'm stuck in 200, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen. So, for example, we don't know yet. Um, we haven't had that discussion yet, and we haven't made a recommendation on you know whether at some point we're going to need to do testing again. Um, we don't know what the uh, updated guidance will be from uh, IDPH and ISBE regarding opening school next year. We suspect there will be. Um, some updated guidance coming sometime after July 4th before we start in August. Um, so there are just a number of question marks right now. And um, also, uh, if we had um, some significant flare up of uh, the virus sometime during the year, and it, it's, you know, somehow impacted all schools, not just us, uh, then we might have to, you know, kind of revisit or redo some of the uh, PPE protocol that uh, we had in place next year. So it's really at this point, Dan, kind of a placeholder for us. A hundred percent a placeholder. I don't know what, is there going to be tests? Don't know any of that stuff. 
I don't assume it's going to be nothing. I don't think that's wise. I don't think it's going to be half a million dollars based on what I know. But as we know, anything can change. Um, for sure, it's got to be at least 50000 guaranteed. But beyond that, I don't know. I have a placeholder of 200000 because I don't know. Yes. And so that's you can also think in your head. And right, that's Dan? a discussion for another time. Just oh, for keep, sure. Just to keep us focused on the budget tonight, yep. we're not going to go into any discussion about um, those expenditures because at this point, not only is it not on our agenda for tonight, but it's premature. Yeah, we don't know. But I have to put a number in there right now. So of course. it's just, a, it's honestly a guess. Um, I would love it to be like not a dollar more than 50,000, you know, but, but that's assuming a lot of things work out ideally, you know? Yeah. So um, we got, that would be, that would we, be great. If we got through this year and didn't have to use any of it, but the second year of the software, second year of the software agreement for the uh, thermal temp scanners, you know, that would be a wonderful outcome for everyone. Yeah. Desired so, state. Oh, sorry. My bad. So uh, think back to the $150,000 surplus we had. Really, it's like 350 because of this 200, all right? So keep that in your in your mind, all right? But on paper, it is 153, but so I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, so so this is this final one, I think it's final, um, is just all of them kind of, all of our expenditures kind of combined on one sheet. Salaries, benefits, and then really all the departments now have shifted into their objects. So like purchase services, that's when we pay for a service, the biggest part of that and why that biggest change that's our food service returning to normal, transportation returning to normal. That's so that's why that's going up. That's really the what those costs are. Everything else is kind of similar, some not changes because it's really the based on I think the more meaningful information is looking at the departments. This is not super meaning. Some of these other numbers are not really meaningful, in my opinion. Um, other than the other objects, that's where we have the tuition for those students. So um, one thing I wanted to just let you know. So what is capital outlay? Capital outlay is we spend more than $10,000 on a one item. That's big stuff. So that's big projects, that's cars. It's not computers. It's not a $5,000 computer. We don't buy whatever service costs. It's not that. It's $10,000 or more. Um, other objects are things that don't fit in the other categories. The biggest one of that is tuition. That's considered an other object. Um, Non-capitalized equipment is this weird this is Illinois State's rules that we allocated this way. It's something that costs between $500. And for us, our capitalization threshold, which is 10,000. Remember I told you capital outlay is anything over 10,000? We as a board, y'all, well, some of you only, I think Jim was here when it was set at 10,000. So anything between $500 per item and $10,000 per item is called non-capitalized equipment. It's really just an accounting thing, but you can think of it as somewhat some bigger stuff but not really big stuff is the way I can translate it. So overall uh, operating change of 5.23% on all of our expenditures versus last year, which I'm, I'm, I, I believe is largely um, returning to normal a lot of our other costs, plus accounting for um, our salaries and additional staffing that we've done. So that's the expenditure side. Any questions? on the expenditure. Okay, so then just revisiting this, this same, this is the same chart as before. So now you've seen all of the numbers, all of the funds that they're in. We're right now sitting at a, a budgeted surplus of 150,000. But remember there's 200,000 of COVID, so 350. And then I would love to try to improve it by a couple hundred thousand by the benefits, but I can't do that yet until fiscal year, until June is done. And so I need to look at that. So I'm hoping to come back here next time with a slightly higher, it's not going to be like a million and a half dollars or anything, but it's going to be a little bit higher. Um, so, so here's what I would say. Um, this is, and I think will be the smallest budget surplus we have had in a very long time. 16 years. So, um, so what this means is I believe that we can afford everything that we need or have decided to do. I am a little concerned with future years. So we will have to watch this very closely, I think for the future, because I don't see our revenues, our revenues are not going to increase 4% after next, you know what I mean? That's not going to happen. It's going to be closer to the two 
percent. So we need to watch this stuff uh, is my recommendation because what I don't want us to do, we are trying to avoid a deficit spending that gets us to the position that we're cutting programs. I want to avoid that as much as possible. So we are in a, we're in a stable position right now. A little bit more concerned for the future, but we'll, we'll, we'll remain to be seen. So we had projections that showed we were going to be good for a couple of years. We probably still are, but <coughs> things are closer than they were a year ago. So, and I will note for the record that you have, that is not the first time that you have said that and we are paying attention. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to cry wolf or anything. Like I've seen this go down and I just want, I want us to be mindful of this because I don't want that number to be negative. Um, so that's what I have to give you on the tentative budget. You have sheets with you that have all kinds of detail you could ever want to look at um, if you want to. But I feel like now you have the tools to read them and to kind of see and compare. Um, so timeline for adoption. So uh, tonight is our first view of the tentative budget. Uh, what we're proposing <coughs> is July 26th, we do the public hearing. That's a legal hearing you have to do before you can adopt the budget. So we typically don't, we don't do it the same night as we do adoption. Although legally you can, but we don't. Um, so the proposed legal hearing on July 26th, you have to do a 30 days notice. So we would basically publish the notice in the paper kind of tomorrow that that's coming. Um, then what we would look at to do is, so do that on July 26th. And then August 9th is the night of our uh, committee meetings um, that we'd return back to a committee structure on August 9th. We would have a special meeting uh, on the budget to review again, uh, or potentially adopt if we feel that we're at that point. If not, then we would push adoption to August 23rd, which is our regular board meeting um, for adoption. So that is. Dan, is, is I just did some uh, quick math here with the help of a calculator, of course. So am I accurate in saying or in calculating that the, um, Overage or surplus that we're showing right now is about 0 0.003 of the 90 plus million dollar budget. Sure, it's very small. So, so way less than one percent. Significantly, yeah. yes. Okay, that was the point I wanted to make. Yep. Tiny. And it's based on variables that you don't know all yeah. of the answers to yet. So. Yes. And, and, and truly, I, I try to do this. I'll, I'll tell you when I know something. I'll tell you when I don't know something. So, You um, do an amazing job of it, Dan. I've been here a couple of years now, and you, <laughs> you do an amazing job when you don't have all of the actual concrete numbers doing the estimates um, in an extremely accurate way. So we appreciate it. Uh, here, here. Other questions for Dan tonight? I will not be here August 9th. Can tell you that so okay. just for timeline planning neither will you but <laughs> uh night's committee meeting night right yeah. it's a regular committee Perfect. meeting night all right so let's we know you for sure casey right maybe a flexible on this okay one, but in theory i i could see a zoom being useful for me to zoom in <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll monitor that and then we'll have to look at. Yeah, it's not your problem like. anymore. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> no, ensuring. Thanks a quorum, for reminding me. Ensuring a quorum is my problem. So please keep me yeah. posted. And that may be the difference between doing it on the ninth and just doing right. it on the board meeting. That's what I was exactly. the, the actual adoption. We do, based on that tentative schedule, have some flexibility. Okay. Okay. And if, if after now you review anything, you have further questions, you can obviously always contact me. I'm happy to, to talk you through and answer any questions you have. And I will amplify that point. Dan is always very um, helpful and generous with his time and welcomes uh, questions. So if you review tonight's presentation and you do have questions, um, that is the guy who will help you. So with that, President Hessel. 
Yes, sir. So that, that concludes our initial budget presentation and discussion. And if there are no further questions regarding the budget presentation, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Great. Roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Bruni. Aye. Batson. Aye. Oh, pardon me. The motion passes. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.